Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this discussion on alternative investment in small business financing. My name is Carolyn Caro, and I'm an associate director uh, with the Milken Institute. Uh, in my role, I work on initiatives dealing with economic development and small business, and one of those is our PLUM initiative, the Partnership for Lending in Underserved Markets, and I recognize some plumbers in the room, so thank you. Um, <laughs> And with our partner, the SBA, we are looking at how to support uh, capital access for minority entrepreneurs. This, uh, this panel today, we're looking at alternative financing for all Californians. Though the recovery is well underway, the fact of the matter is small businesses still lack access to capital. And alternative financing has stepped in to fill the gap. Uh, so to join us in this conversation, we have a great panel today, and I'm gonna start on my right. Uh, Assembly Member Burke, thank you for joining us. Uh, Assembly Member Burke represents the 62nd District of California, which includes uh, part of the West Side and Northern uh, South Bay regions of LA County, and such diverse neighborhoods and communities as Inglewood, El Segundo, Marina Del Rey, and Venice. Assembly Member Burke has made expanding healthcare access and economic uh, opportunity for her constituents the focus of her legislative agenda. Uh, in the small business space, just this year, she authored three buildings supporting small business growth and capital access. AB 999 sought to establish an angel tax credit program. Emphasis and outreach was focused on minority and women-owned bus small businesses in economically disadvantaged areas. AB 1230 sought to leverage federal matching dollars to increase funding to California's small business development centers in order to increase the number of businesses re receiving free and confidential technical assistance. And finally, AB 1266 sought a $5 million extension in the line of credit given to the State Assistance for Enterprise, Business, and Industrial Development Corporation, better known as Safe Bidco, a state-owned not-for-profit corporation conducting affordable direct lending to small businesses throughout the state. Next, we have Manny Fernandez. Mandy is a Silicon Valley angel investor, serial entrepreneur, and best-selling author featured on CNBC's Make Me a Millionaire Inventor. He is also co-founder and CEO of DreamFunded, a crowdfunding platform providing exclusive insider access to some of the most sought after seed and later stage private companies in America. Manny has been an angel investor with Indus Entrepreneurs Angels since 2012, and in 2013, he founded the San Francisco Angels Group. In 2014, Manny was named San Francisco Angel Investor of the Year and received the Equity Crowdfunding Leadership Award. And just last year, he was named by Incorporated Magazine as one of 33 entrepreneurs to watch, as well as a Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Equity Crowdfunding Pioneer by Menlo College. Manny has been featured on mainstream media, including CNBC Squawk Box, The Wall Street Journal, NBC, CNN Latino, Forbes, and Fox News. Thanks, Manny. Next, we have Chris Hamitman. Chris is president of Tech Coast Angels, Los Angeles, and incoming chairman of the Tech Coast Angels Network, the most active angel investment organization in Southern California, funding early stage entrepreneurs, as well as providing them the mentoring and operational assistance necessary for growth and success. Chris is also the CEO of Rainforest LA, a private equity firm focused on early stage growth. He has been a board member, advisor, and venture investor for a variety of companies in fields ranging from fintech, biotech, and robotics to digital media and gaming, machine learning, and consumer goods. Prior to becoming a venture capitalist, Chris was a transactional attorney working on notable projects across LA, including Century City Mall and the Howard Hughes Center. He's also been president of the American Law Group for the past 18 years. Chris holds a JD from right here, UCLA School of Law, and a BA in Art History from Duke. Next, I'm happy to introduce my friend Victor Parker. Victor is from the Los Angeles, uh, Victor Parker is the Los Angeles District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration, our partner in Plum, making him the most senior SBA executive in the Los Angeles District, which includes Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Victor oversees the delivery of SBA programs and services to aspiring and existing small business owners SBA lenders and partners, including business advisory services, capital access programs, entrepreneurial development, international trade development, and contract procurement assistance. Before joining the SBA, Victor spent nearly 20 years in the private sector, providing him with extensive management and government contracting experience. 
In addition, Victor is actively engaged with several civic not-for-profit and community organizations, including serving on the Civil Service Commission, Sustainable City Committee, and on the Board of the Directors for the Community Development Center <coughs> Incorporated. Victor earned his bachelor's from the UC Berkeley and his JD from Pepperdine School of Law. Victor also brings to this panel particular knowledge of SBICs, small business investment companies, which are privately owned investment companies licensed by the SBA. SBICs supply small businesses with financing in both the equity and debt arenas and provide a viable alternative to venture capital firms for many small entrepreneurs seeking startup capital. And finally, we have Dr. Richard Swart. Uh, Richard is currently a senior advisor to CrowdSmart, a Bay Area investing platform and venture fund that leverages artificial and human intelligence for seed stage investing. He was recently appointed by the appointed the Filene Fellow in Emerging Technology and Visiting Researcher at UC Irvine, where he will focus on fintech and its social impact as part of the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion. Richard has advised a number of foreign governments and major institutions on crowdfunding, fintech, and social impact, including the World Bank and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's also served as a research scholar in the Institute for Business and Social Innovation in the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, and was the university's resident expert on, on evolving models of alternative finance. So thank you all for joining um, us today. Uh, we're going to start with a few questions and hopefully have some time at the end for a little bit of Q&A. I actually can't see the countdown clock, so if I do this, I'm looking at the time. <laughs> um, so can we have slide one, please? Okay, so let's start with where we are today. In 2016, California provided 41% of all U.S. alternative financing in the country and received 58% of it. New York trailed in second place, providing 24% of alternative financing and receiving just 12%. And after Texas, we see the provision and reception of alternative financing dropping substantially. So the first question goes to Manny. How did we get here? What has made California the dominant player in this space? Thank you. Well, I can't speak for the whole California, but from where I'm at, Silicon <laughs> Valley, and maybe as a majority of the money going through there, is that fortunate there's certain companies like Google and Facebook made a lot of investors money and so the buzz is out and more people are putting more money in to support the newer companies like TaskRabbit was just acquired by IKEA, one of my investments. And there's many other younger companies that are up and coming. And then if you look at Hollywood here, many of the private capital is going into movies is also creating that, that huge number. So I think it's just Earlier investors are realizing they made money, people hearing about it, and they're now supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs. Anyone else want to weigh in? What has made California the leading player in this space? I think Manny's on the right track, but I think it's important to talk about just the wealth effect in general. The Silicon Valley supplies 58% of all the money on the AngelList platform globally. I mean, it's almost basically the valley investing in the valley. And this, the second and third generation of innovators coming out of the valley started looking at alternative financial vehicles, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer lending, marketplace lending, crowdfunding, different vehicles. And they saw this as an opportunity to innovate and create new markets. Mm. So it's essentially the valley expanding its reach into new market opportunities. The, it's basically a contest between San Francisco and New York for leadership in this industry. And so far, California is dominating without question. And I would also like to add, it's, I think it's a reflection of the, the diversity of, of industry we have in California. I represent the 62nd district. We have everything but a farm. I have aerospace. I have biotech. I have Silicon Beach. I have, we really have a diversity of industry in the 62nd, which is just a really good representation of what California really looks like. And so I think that that broad scope and that commitment to innovation is another reason that we, that we see a lot of that. Right. You know, let me chime in as well. California is unbelievable, um, not, not only from the standpoint of natural resources, but from our human capital resources as well. We have some of the best uh, universities and institutions in the world. So when you add money plus brilliance, you know, you're going to get this kind of uh, early stage growth. Uh, because again, we've got uh, just these nexuses of uh, just money in Silicon Valley, money here down in LA, and then you have Caltech, you have UCLA, you have you know, Stanford, you have Berkeley, and you, know, you put those things together, and then you have very, very fertile ground for this kind of growth. 
And then we also pull back to uh, the practicality of investment. When you're a venture capitalist or an angel investor, you basically want to have companies that are close by. I want to be able to visit my companies, talk to my companies, talk to my founders, talk to my teams. So if most of the capital that's being raised and invested is from California and venture capitalists based in San Francisco, you're going to see just an unbelievable tilting towards those funds going to California-based companies. Right. Exactly, and I agree. You know, when you're talking about it, and I think the assembly member mentioned it, um, just looking at Los Angeles County, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties alone, we have everything, including the farm. I mean, we've got the wineries, we've got strawberry, we've got the right. strawberry orchards, we've got all these different things that are going on. So we touch so many different market sectors, and so many of these market sectors are growing market sectors on top of it. When you look at healthcare and a lot of the innovation that's going on, it makes a lot of sense that California would really be driving, be the driving force mm -hmm. for capital. And actually, this is a great segue to our next question, um, if we can have slide two. So California is leading. We have a lot of investment coming in and out. However, it's very clear that certain industries and populations are reaping the benefit more than others. For example, among California-backed angel investment deals, the majority goes to software development, followed by uh, business products and healthcare. And demographically, only 4% of all angel deals are Californ uh, in California are with female minority entrepreneurs. So Chris, first we'll take on the industry piece. Why is so much money flowing towards software? All right, you know, that, it's actually a very easy question to answer. When you think about where is this money coming from? Okay, capital, money, is basically the growth, is the fuel of the economy and early stage investment and, and company formation. So when you look at those things, think about what is the motivation behind the people actually funding uh, these companies? Well, a lot of the time they're venture capitalists. I hope we're all familiar with a term called IRR, which is basically your, your return on your investment. And now your IRR is usually very time sensitive. So if I'm able to get a very quick return on my investment, that's going to be sometimes better as far as investment optics goes than getting a very large multiple on a return 10 years from now. Okay, so here we have that context. Now look at software development. I can take a couple of um, men or women, you know, uh, raise a million dollars, raise $500,000, or even have a couple of people working in a garage. And within three to six months, they can build just with themselves and a computer their minimum viable product. This is software product, SaaS, software as a service, which hopefully can be a 10x improvement on the current state of the art. Then they can put that out into the ecosystem. It can be tried and tested. And then you get to the gold standard of early stage growth, which is product market fit. Your product and the market have to agree with each other that this is a very valuable thing. Software, you can invest a relatively small amount of money and human resources to get to MVP, minimum viable product, and product market fit. Now, okay, so we can do that in six to 12 months sometimes. Let's flip it. And I'll take an example of one of the companies I'm invested in, which is a pharma med tech company. We have had to raise, in the last year alone, $80 million. And that is with a time horizon of five years before we know we're going to get to product market fit. So if you're going to make your investment dollar, would you rather know within six to 12 months if you've got product market fit or have to invest $80 million to even get to the same place? That's why you see a lot more dollars, especially VC-backed dollars, who are very IRR-driven, going towards software development over any other asset class. So Richard, how do we get money going to other industries? Several things. <clears throat> First of all, I think it's important to talk about you know, high-growth potential startups is one subset of the economy. We then have sort of lower growth potential but still very stable startups, mm -hmm. less sexy, the $100 million, $200 million acquisition targets. Then you have small to medium businesses. And I think a lot of these conversations, we conflate all those terminologies and we treat a restaurant the same as we do a software startup in these discussions and they're very distinctly different. So the first thing is a lot of the challenge in angel investing is they have to have multiples that are ridiculous, 20x, 50x, 100x on the investments because of the significant number of investments that fail because of the lack of data around product market fit, like Chris was saying, that's actually exactly what CrowdSmart is attacking, is answering that question using AI. But the challenge is, for many people, it really becomes social ties. I mean, to cut through all the hype, the reality is it's very hard to get an investment unless you have so, some social tie or connectivity to somebody who's writing the check. And that's one reason why you see so much preference for white males. And 
the, the venture capital system is essentially race and gender biased, and also the 99% of the money in venture capital flows to graduates of the top 10 universities in America. So there's both an elitist aspect of venture capital. And venture capital is not the same thing as angel, which is not the same thing as crowdfunding. They're very different. So the first is, if you're talking about communities of color or underserved communities, there's a huge knowledge gap, and a lot of the resources and businesses in those communities are not provided adequate education, whether it's even in the language or in those communities. If you're looking at SMBs, the, you know, I've done a lot of work with the SBDCs, there's still sort of a, a marketing and branding challenge of who understands and who provides what resources. And unfortunately, with the explosion of the internet and everyone's a self-appointed expert now, it's very hard for entrepreneurs to know whom to trust and who's a reliable source of data. So you see a lot of people sort of falling for, I'm going to call it information traps. So I think as a state or as Milken Institute, figuring out how to produce information in a way that's consumable by the average startup. So I used to work for a billionaire who had a project to look at how to help rural entrepreneurship. We found the average person starting a business in America outside of the Valley or New York reads at a seventh grade level. The average American reads at a 7.2 grade level, which is why USA Today sells so well. Because they write it, <laughs> no, I'm, literally, they, they, they write at about a fourth grade level. That's the reading level of USA Today. New York Times is 13th grade, USA Today is fourth grade. The problem is the average person walking into an SBDC center probably reads at a seventh or eighth grade level. They have no financial literacy. The average American is financially illiterate. So I'm talking about the small business side. So there's a massive amount of financial literacy education that has to happen, a lot of outreach through the community structures that exist. Mm -hmm in culturally appropriate and linguistically appropriate ways. So that's not exactly the same thing as how do we get more money flowing into biotech as an angel investor. A lot of that is, I think, mining data and using AI and data science and their technologies to really make more predictions about where the money should go. A lot of angel investors are spray and pray. You know, if you look at the Angel Research Institute data, to have a decent return, you have to have a minimum of 22 investments. And with the need for continual capital calls, it means you've got to have a pretty big war chest to be able to keep writing those checks. So unfortunately, you see a lot of angel investors and even angel lists, which I'm a member of, you can't get into a deal if you're not willing to write a quarter million dollar check or a $100,000 check. So it's very hard even for you know, the young entrepreneurs at Google or software engineers who are making 300000 a year who qualify as investors, they still can't get involved. There's sort of this club of exclusivity bound by wealth. And I've been going too long, so I'll let somebody else answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, and no, listen, I think you're going perfect. I, I think I really appreciate a lot of what you just said. The, the reality is there is a social element to getting a lot of these funds. And as someone who represents a district that is, you, you know, represents a very disadvantaged community and a very wealthy community, we see that divide regularly. And, and, and so for us, I know that in the legislature, one of the big focus is how do we show, how do we teach the people in our low-income communities? How do we show them the path to find money? How do we get to angels investors? Because that pathway is not laid out in that simple format as one maybe who graduated from Princeton or Yale. And in a community where 70% of our students who enter into high school never see a four-year university or a community college, how do those folks who have great ideas, who are smart, who, have, who are very capable, and who are ready to fight, to really fight for their companies, how do we show them the way to get access to those kind of funds? And so I think exactly what you're saying is exactly right. That is a woman, listen, women-owned businesses contribute one, over a trillion dollars to the United States. 7.7 .7 million, million people are employed by women-owned businesses. We have, we have the skills that it takes to, make, to create successful, profitable businesses, but how do we get to the place where we get access to the funds. That's really something as a from the legislature that we have to address. Great. Anyone else want to? And I think you know one of the things, and, and you're absolutely right, um, in fact, I think in California, if we're not, we're at least number one or number two in number of women-owned businesses in the country. And so it's really about trying to figure out from the SBIC perspective, which is an alternative that SBA provides in terms of equity funding, um, which, which Carolyn talked about. But it's really about figuring out how do we engage those communities that do not have access to the SBIC program or even in educate them about SBIC. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's about taking our new approach with small business development centers, with women's business centers, and even our SCORE chapters at SBA funds to provide those one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. How do we better educate our communities so that they can take advantage of these different programs? How do we incentivize um, different folks, whether it's our lending partners or other folks, to really take advantage of the SBIC program? Because when you look at the fact that you can get $2 of 
government uh, guaranteed debt for every one dollar of private capital that goes into a small business, that's a tremendous opportunity that we really have to figure out how to better leverage and expose our small businesses to. Um, we're, we're doing things with SBA, for example, with an online learning tool to talk about how to educate folks on various different um, financing opportunities. But again, it's about how do we expand that to reach those markets that are a little bit more difficult, whether it's because they're urban markets or rural markets. And so there's really a, a tremendous wealth of, of opportunity to grow that to keep California moving forward. That's great. The solution for this is the following. As an angel investor, I'm investing in stocks or a convertible note and because we expect the company to greatly grow. However, that same instrument, meaning selling stocks or a convertible note, doesn't work for small businesses. So for those that are outside of the tech world, which is most of the companies in California, they're small businesses and they're trying to raise money talking to angels. Angels are not going to be interested because, number one, it's never going to grow. So therefore, it's a lifestyle business. The entrepreneur will do well, but the investor will never do well. So there's this thing that they're using in Texas a lot. It's called revenue share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where it's a person invests and they get a percentage of the revenue, net revenue of the business. So therefore, the investor can make some money. Not a lot of money, but they make some money. And I think that's something that California and the many small businesses should look into to effectively, something's in it for the investor then. So think about using a revenue share note. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And, um, and I think, Richard, you, you started to speak to this, sort of the difference between uh, not all alternative finance is the same. And what we're hearing a lot about recently is crowdfunding. So I wanted to sort of hone in on crowdfunding for a moment. So when many of us hear about crowdfunding, we think about platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where backers might receive a free product or a reward. Like, I have my reading rainbow mug um, yeah. for, <laughs> for contributing to that campaign. Um, but in 2016, with the implementation of the Title III of the Jobs <coughs> Act, also known as Regulation Crowdfunding, Reg CF, ordinary Americans can now invest in private companies in exchange for equity or debt. Under Reg CF, startups can raise up to $1 million in a 12-month period from unaccredited investors, that is, those earning less than $200,000 a year with a net worth of less than $1 million. This allows 97% of Americans to participate in and benefit from the explosive growth of crowdfunding investment. And if we could have slide three, please. So what an explosive growth. With an estimated market value of $34 billion in 2015, crowdfunding has come a long way since its early valuation of less than a million dollars in 2010. In fact, in 2016, globally, crowdfunding exceeded uh, venture capital investment. So, Chris, I know you're excited for this question. Oh, uh, <laughs> what does the explosive growth of crowdfunding mean to you? And how do the angels and VCs perceive crowdfunding, particularly Reg CF crowdfunding? All right. Yeah, I'm going to have to unpack this a little bit just because Please. I look at that chart and I'm, there's no way. This is not accurate data. And I don't think many of us up here will look at that and say, oh, yeah, crowdfunding. It's like, it's unbelievable. There's billions of dollars. I do this every day. We don't raise anything or practically anything on crowdfunding platforms. It just doesn't work. And I, fundamentally, from an angel standpoint, with accredited investors, now accredited investors are traditionally what angel investors are. That means you have a million dollars in net assets above and beyond your, your personal residence, or you've made $200,000 or $350,000, I think it is, as a married couple for the last two years. $300,000 the last two years. Now, what we're doing with this Regulation CF is everyone can now play. We all can make these investments, right? Well, the reality is, do you know how hard it is to get the universe to understand that you're actually out there seeking investment? I mean, how many, raise your hand right now if you know of five, now there are thousands of crowdfunding platforms. You know five companies right now that are crowdfunding? Anyone raise your hand? Okay, so we have two or three. So we have a couple, well, okay, we're a stacked crowd. Normally it would be, <laughs> normally it would be just about nothing, right? I get emails every day from my brokerage house saying, okay, these are actual legitimate IPOs going out. You know, oil field company X, biotech company Y. I have never heard of these companies. And they are companies generating hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. What do you think it takes for a startup with zero dollars in their bank account, get the marketing spin to be able to let the entire country know that they are raising money? So fundamentally speaking, I think crowdfunding doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. 
Those not, how, can you, how can you get that kind of number? It's not even possible. There's no rational reality in which that, that chart is accurate. Okay, we're on. Well, <laughs> one, last, one last one. Also, regulation, we really don't know what's going on with regulation. So I'm not going to take my beautifully funded accredited investor deal and bring in crowdfunded non-accredited investors that potentially could jeopardize the entire transaction and basically sink that company by one shareholder lawsuit saying, I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't financially you know, uh, intelligent enough to make that investment, but I did. So now we unwind the entire transaction. I am terrified of crowdfunding, but I don't even think it's worth it. So lose, lose. It's going to be a fun debate here. This is going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Get this up. All right, so I am the vice president of the Crowdfunding <laughs> Professional Association. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's have some fun here. First of Come all, crowdfunding me. not invented here. It's very important to understand America is a laggard. Okay? It was created in Western Europe, was created in the UK. The growth, the momentum, the experimentation, the innovation was not invented in America, not invented in California. One of the few things you can say that about. So the model works, global numbers. Now when they say crowdfunding, I know crowdfunder, I won't say anything about the platform, but they're not data scientists, let's put it that way. They're, they're lumping everything together. There's crowdfunding for social impact in East Africa. There's crowdfunding for consumer products and goods on Circle Up, backed by Procter & Gamble. There's angel investing on AngelList, which essentially is just syndication of deals using traditional financial models. I mean, you're, you're seeing a confluence of probably 10 or 20 different types of crowdfunding lumped together, and they could not be more radically different. Your question, though, is about Reg CF. Now, Reg CF, as it was intended, as it passed the House in 2012, and I was literally in the House chamber watching it happen, had a $10 million cap, it allowed special purpose vehicles, and it had very lightweight regulation. Then it hit the Senate, <laughs> then there was a vote trade on the XM bill, and then it got destroyed, and then Congress said, okay, we like this. By the way, the House leadership, McCarthy, Scalise, everyone in the House loves Crowdfunding, and I've literally heard um, Chairman McCarthy speak at the Cato Institute spend 25 minutes extolling the virtues of Reg CF. Why? It's a libertarian dream. It allows people to invest where they wish with their money to back businesses they care about in their community without government interference. Then that dream hit the SEC, and the SEC dragged it to death to the point that Congress literally had to threaten to defund the SEC if they would not <laughs> pass Reg CF. I'm not joking. There's been that much opposition, primarily by AARP, who believes that crowdfunding is the vehicle to steal money from grandma, which it's not, but that's the per perception. So there's been massive political pressure and massive political lobbying to make this thing inoperable. And they succeeded. There's 1,700 pages of regulation for the JOBS Act. It's a seven-page bill. There's seven acts. If you add up all the regulation of all seven acts, there's 1,700 pages. Reg CF is designed to fail, and it's failing in most ways. Month to month, you're seeing about 200 companies in America try it. That's 200. How many people pitch you a month at TCA? <laughs> Pitch us a month? No, no, no. <laughs> you really want a serious answer? No, not we, pitch. We see, about, we see about 1,000 deals come through our pipeline a year. A year, OK. Yeah. And there's? 800, 900 angel groups in America, depending on how right. you count them. So, well, yeah. so the reality is Reg CF, as it's currently structured, is sort of unwieldy. It takes tens of thousands of dollars of marketing effort to really make a successful pitch. It's very expensive. It takes a lot of energy. And the cap is only a million dollars and 70,000. The inflation index it up a little bit. There's movement in Congress to try to bring it back to a five or $10 million cap. Now, if that happens, all of a sudden it starts competing with other forms of early stage capital. Right now, at a million dollar cap, it's not doing much. So again, this chart, I don't believe either. I agree with you. <laughs> but you're seeing a lot of usage of different parts of the JOBS Act, which has implication for IPOs, has implication for traditional Reg D finance. It, people just conflate everything. Reg CF tends to work well for restaurants, food-based beverages, distilleries, um, people that have a physical community or a circle of affinity they can physically tap and engage in their community to invest into their community. 91% of the investors are not accredited, 9% are accredited, average age about 38 years old, mostly white males. I can go on and on if you want to get data wonky. But it's, it's not millennials, it's sort of, you know, 
middle, you know, people about my age that have a little bit of money that are willing to give Jimmy some money, but we also know that investors in crowdfunding skip over pro formas, financial disclosures, risk statements, anything that a sophisticated investor would zone in on, they ignore. They look at the video, I like Sally, I want to back Sally's business, so they make an emotional decision on whether they want to support that entrepreneur. And I think that's fundamentally good in America, that people who could not get funding due to race and gender and other bias issues are now starting to get funding, and we're seeing more women succeed in Reg CF than other forms of capital, but it is not a sophisticated financial investment, and very few Americans are buying individual stocks any longer. How many of you, well, this is a long audience. In the average room, how many people buy individual stocks versus index funds or ETFs? Maybe five. How many of you would like to buy a stock in a company with zero liquidity horizon for 10 years? No data, no IRRs to report, and no ability to talk about what the performance of the asset class is. That's where we're at. Let me pull just one jewel out of, of those many jewels. <laughs> What works for CF, what works for is the sexy, sexy company, like the three-wheeled car yeah. or yeah. cannabis, <laughs> things that people are just, how else do I invest in this? Or this is a unicorn type investment. There's one of a kind. There's no other opportunity to invest in this space but through this. So that where you can kind of propel out of this gravitational pull of every other company in the world and you truly are something special that is going to capture the media's attention, it works. But if you're a standard company that just uh, makes a ton of money, you know, that's really not going to be enough. So yeah. you really have to have some special sizzle uh, beyond you know, economics. Manny, you're let's, warming yeah, up let's over hear Manny. Yeah, Manny. <laughs> so I come from the perspective of an entrepreneur that early in my years was raising money and it was challenging for, to do so. Look who I look like. And I was able to have a company sold and then um, found in an angel group. So I'm familiar with the tr traditional accredited investors investing. And then what we found in when San Francisco was a really international city, being on panels, many investors wanted to co-invest. So I thought back in my early 20s, my first dream was to create a startup. My second dream was to get funded. So I created uh, a vehicle where um, other investors wanted to co-invest with us. So we call it, created Dream Funded. The reason I bring Dream Funded up is was really for the accredited investors that were not in San Francisco's network. One of our early members of SF Angels was an early in Google investor and PayPal investor, former partner Ron Conway, very big name. With a, I've been operating this since 2014, so <laughs> dealing with accredited investors, and we're the first one approved by FINRA and the SEC in Silicon Valley area. Now, contrary to their belief, because they're an outsider looking in, and I'm an insider going to reveal data that probably never been revealed before, so pay very close attention. <laughs> it's not a stranger caring about another stranger's company. The successful fundraisers, again, one of our biggest um, successful fundraisers, a co company called Notion, they raised 250,000 on Kickstarter, then raised with us, closed a $2 million round, later um, funded, raised $10 million in a Series A. Unique case, the founder had a network, and a network was following him on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Now, how much does that cost to set up? And if anyone has a problem with paying for LinkedIn or Facebook, I'll pay your monthly fees. So utilizing that as a, <laughs> there's no fees, guys. Utilizing, <laughs> it was a trick question. Some of you guys are paying attention here. I'm on the <laughs> Premier account. <All> right. so, uh, <laughs> 34 bucks will cover it. Okay. So, so the point is, you can reach out to your network. And if you reach out to your network, people are doing it, not so much of the investment. They're doing it because they like you and want to make you a success, mm -hmm. period. And then maybe they have a piece of paper that if you're successful in the back of their mind, wow, you know, you may be the next Google guy or something. So it's starting with people who they know and extension of their friends, so it costs no marketing money. And it is companies that did well are the kind of normal companies that everyone understands. Tech has not done well with this. So we are no longer want to be part of the reg regulation CF. It doesn't work for us because the dynamics between an early stage company, really, really, really early guy getting started. He may be using tech, but he's not a tech startup, meaning there's not technical people programming. But he needs to raise money because, unfortunately, a person is not in that network, or maybe it's a woman or, or a minority, that needs to raise that first money to give him a shot to do something. He can't get an SBA loan because that takes two years. He can, cannot get a bank hey, loan, so this hey, is the hey, only hey, way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. He can't launch at the SBA. Right? <laughs> so 
<laughs> organizing his network and they reach out to their network and once it's a successful campaign, having some success is very much like you walking into a restaurant and there's an empty tip jar. Would you guys be obligated to put a dollar in? What if you walk into a restaurant and it had a filled tip jar? How about now? Would you put money in? Well, some people do. So, <laughs> so the people that have their own network and start the campaign, maybe phone calls, sending out emails, doing the social media, then get the others to support them. So I think using organic methods of raising has been what has uh, really uh, been really well for many of the founders that have a connected community. Thank you, and, and that's a, Victor, I was going to ask you um, for some of these examples of how crowdfunding has benefited um, minority and women and, and along the lines of early stage capital. Right, and so, you know, and, and you're absolutely right to a certain extent. I'm not gonna agree on the two year part. Mm. Uh, but I will agree on the fact that, you know, all small businesses aren't gonna necessarily fit in the SBA box um, in terms of the different continuum of programs that we have. So crowdfunding does increase that tool. And I think the key to that is really that local type investment that we're talking about. We're talking about not necessarily dealing with it from a federal perspective, because most small businesses, they don't have the bandwidth, they're not even thinking about a national um, strategy in terms of raising funds. And so if we had opportunities from a state level or a much more local level, all of us know pillar businesses in our communities that to an average investor, they're not gonna look at it, but we are aware that that dry cleaner or that particular restaurant that's on the corner that everybody goes to and has been around you know, for generations is really the business that we really need to be able to invest in, and that's where crowdfunding helps to build that capital flow and then graduate them into the SBA program or graduate them into other different programs or loan lending opportunities for them to gain capital. So I think it's about looking at ways to streamline that process and then going back to what we talked about earlier is having our small business development centers, our women's business centers, coach small businesses on how to address when you're looking at trying to get crowdfunding. It's not the same process, it's not the same approach as if you're trying to obtain traditional lending. So we really have to take a look at how do we better educate and institutionalize the mentality of folks even understanding crowdfunding. You know, do we need to go back to leveraging our ethnic chambers of commerce and some of our more geographic chambers of commerce to reach those rural communities so that they understand the way that to, to navigate crowdfunding, how to, how to deal with pitching to an angel investor. There, there's nothing, I mean, again, you can go back on the internet and people will Google it, but I think it's really important for, for us as the SBA to provide the tools and the resources so that folks are educated to be able to do that. And as someone I was going to say, so 25% of your district is African American and over 40% Latino. Yeah. Do you see crowdfunding as being an opportunity? Listen, uh, for them, and I know a lot of women, to answer your question, I do actually know several women that have used crowdfunding <laughs> to launch their businesses, and it is a stepping stone. And it's a vital stepping stone for a lot of people who don't know how to go get an investor or who just aren't ready. And I've seen a lot of success come out of it. I think it's really, really important. Listen, I deal with people who you know, invest in large companies every day. And so often, especially in the state of California, we spend so much time focusing on those companies and not enough time focusing on minority businesses that start at the beginning who, who do scrape together their friends or their LinkedIn <coughs> buddies or their YouTube followers or whatever, however they congregate these folks to give $5, $10, or $1,000 to their cause. And I think it's extremely important. Everyone doesn't get to start at his level. You know, sorry, most people in my district will never meet you. Um, but they can, they can create a really successful business that, that will sustain not just themselves, their families, and their communities. And so, yeah, crowdfunding, I think, is incredibly important. And I don't think we take it seriously enough from the state level. I think it can be a vital tool to help to bridge some of the gaps that we are finding um, as small businesses start and as they move through the stages of employing folks and buying equipment. There is a potential for us to really partner with folks that do crowdfunding and really give them 
the, the legislative backbone that they need to, to be able to really take our community seriously. Let me, let me give you a talking point for your next debate. <laughs> the average company that raises $100,000 in crowdfunding, the very first thing they do is hire an average of 2.2 employees. There you go. I mean, this is what we're talking about. It's, you know, it is not always about, I mean, one day you hope they're Google, but it's not always about yeah. starting. Exactly. Well, that, I think that's a very important point, and what you're making a terrific point, which is why we look at that huge increase in crowdfunding and saying there's so many different buckets. And my investments are absolutely right. We're looking for 20 to 100x companies. That's right. So, you know, if we invest a million dollars, you know, we want that company to be worth a billion dollars right. one day. And, but so these are very different use cases where you say, well, we just want to create a lifestyle business, as Manny suggested. We want, to, we want to create businesses that are operational but aren't necessarily these billion dollar unicorns. So yeah, they, I guess there is a seat at the table for everyone with respect to these programs. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think not only that, but for those folks who eventually do get to your table, I think that it's important that crowdfunding companies and groups, that they show how, when you first take this investment, what the implications are going to be, how you grow from there, and how you're going to have to make that transition. That should be part of the education process. And you don't even want to get me started. Like Entrepreneurship should be part of the education process, period. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a fault that we, we have um, in our education system in general. But that transition should be part of, and that information should be part of once you take this kind of money. One thing that Christopher said um, about being sued. You know, if you're working with an accredited investor network like an angel group, you're not going to go backwards and raise from non-accredited investors. However, if you are getting started, non-accredited investors through like Reg CF may be a great thing. If you can move up and then get to that level, they will always clean up the cap table or do things that will <laughs> ensure that any future law or reduce any future lawsuits. But these are two different things, angel group money and equity crowdfunding is completely different things. And feel free to research. Crowdfunding is very much like saying sports. Like sports, what type of sports? Well, NBA, and then there's you know NFL, football, hockey. There's all these different sports. So equity crowdfunding, to be specific, is people that are making an investment in exchange for a percentage of your company. Now, they, we talk about Reg CF as regulation crowdfunding, which allows everyone to invest, no matter what your net worth is. So I just want to be clear on that. Do research and you guys can have the tools uh, for your future success. Thank you. And you brought up sort of getting a little bit more into the legislative aspect. Um, if we can have slide four. Um, so like with all alternative investing, California is again, um, takes the lead even with Reg CF offerings um, to the tune of just about $8 million last year. That's a little over double the investment of Texas, which is second on the list, and there's only two other states um, that even top a million dollars, New York and Massachusetts. Um, if we can have slide five. So what many states are looking at is interstate crowdfunding exemptions to Reg CF, and so far 36 states have passed such uh, exemptions. Um, so I'll first go to the assembly member. Here so what's, uh, why are we having such a hard, hard time, time in California passing it? I think a couple reasons. Um, the main one being just education. We got held in appropriations this last year. It's over like $1.8 million, which is nothing in consideration of our budget. It, it really just is a, it's about educating our own members about how important you know, this issue is. And, um, and that is a process, and that is a process that takes time. And, and I am lucky because now I'm in a legislature that's a little bit younger, that's a little bit m more ready to deal with issues that are not traditional issues that they've dealt with in the past. And so that makes a good thing. I think it makes it more likely to see something move. But right now, like I said, I just don't think the education has been there with my own members to realize that, what, that this is a potential opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, to Victor, I'll first say, so from the federal government perspective, what are thoughts on interstate and what it can do for California? I think it's going to be really beneficial for California because I think, you know, the, if the state, most of the states that have um, uh, and use the exemption, it's a much simpler process, right? So, so anything that we can do to streamline that process is going to help propel those small businesses. And so we've really got to leverage and take advantage of the fact that the less complicated the process is, as we kind of talked about earlier, these folks are not necessarily, whether it's the business owner or even the investor, they are not those professional investors that are going to be looking at the things that we typically address in the investment community. And so if we are able to, to educate our folks, not only 
legislatively, but from our small business side of the house, um, we are actually able to better provide services for those small businesses. And so we encourage that so that we can actually grow them into SBA programs and grow them out of SBA programs for those that choose to do so and graduate into the next tier uh, of capital. So I think there's, there's a tremendous opportunity for us um, to, to leverage that and help facilitate that in partnership with the state. Great, and I, I was going to ask Richard first, but I'm gonna ask our resident naysayer. <laughs> Chris, um, if you wanna comment on all the interstate regulation. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> you know, you just, you just did. I, and yeah, well, I did. You know what? Again, not the na I'm not the naysayer here. I just don't see the value in it mm -hmm. the same way that other people see the value in it. I do see a lot more value in it when the regulation is clear and understandable. Mm -hmm. If it's clear and understandable and my people um, who are in my group and do the same thing that I do know that we're not going to get in trouble for investing in a company that started at a, at a CF level or started at a crowdfunding level. So there should be safe harbors. Please, let's make sure there's safe harbors. That if companies follow very specifically articulated rules, then the subsequent investment rounds won't get in trouble. If you can make sure that happens, then great. You know, let's everyone join the party. Let's have some fun and let's make some great California companies. I think that's, that's what we have to do. That's, no, that's great perspective. Uh, our other private sector folks? You know, I, Texas, a couple years ago, had an interstate offering, meaning you can raise money only from the state of Texas. And they allowed up to $5,000 for the life of the company. Any person, whatever income or net worth, could invest. So we applied. And after we looked at the numbers for terms of what we had to do to make money, we would have to essentially scale up lower quality companies to be able to make some money with the platform. So I think that if Cal this is, it's good for businesses to be able to raise money, it's good for people to be able to back it, but it's also good for if anyone happens to want to create legislation for California, have the voice of a person that's invested quite a bit in it to understand the flaws of dealing with lawyers that don't know what they're doing and the cost for the startup to be able to file the, the documents and keep the legal compliance and how the business can actually make money doing it because we're not a nonprofit. So I think there's everyone, if there happens to be a law, the people that have been involved in actually writing checks in this sector should be a, a voice for the help the many businesses and um, investors that want to back them. I think we don't want to lose me. money. I, I think he's referring to me. I'm, I'm referring anyone, to all that. Yeah, no, um, but in, listen, in most legislation, I rarely do we do a piece of legislation where we don't have experts or people that are actually stakeholders in the field participate. I, that would be short-sighted of us. And so I think as we move forward, as we look, continue to look at, at the issue, of course, absolutely. That's good input. Richard, any thoughts? Um, just a couple things. First of all, interest state exists because Reg CF was being slow walked by mm -hmm. the SEC. The fundamental value proposition of an interstate platform is challenging because of the cost of scale. To operate a platform, to do marketing, compliance, legal, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to operate a crowdfunding platform. So in a perfect universe, you would create an exemption that would allow a community non-for-profit or a community organization to license some technology, basically protect them from liability, protect them from downstream risk. Um, Vermont has done a really good job. Texas has done a really good job. But even many of these states where you see the legislation, there has been zero dollars funded. I'd say in more than half the states, literally nothing has happened. So the question is, where is there actually activity and what's unique about that set of legislation that allows it to actually propel? Now, Texas has a $5 million cap is one of the things that they've done. Now, many of the, in, the state securities regulators view intrastate <coughs> favorably because they get to review many of the offerings. But the challenge is if you tell a startup in a small town like Clovis, you tell someone in Clovis, let's go spend $50,000 on legal bills, and then you may have you know, FINRA and your state regulator breathing down your neck, suddenly your compliance and risk just skyrocket. So there has to be a model where the, the risk to the company and the risk to the platform are minimized substantially. I think the application is looking at community crowdfunding for small businesses such as in the Valley, such as in Northern California. You're not gonna, the Valley meaning Central Valley, not Silicon Valley. Um, you're not gonna see a lot of adoption of interest state crowdfunding in Menlo Park. 
Mm -hmm. right? I think the regional piece is really, really important because, in particular here in California, because we have so many different market sectors that we're touching that if we do do it on a much more regional basis, I think you're going to find much more input because you've got that base of that particular industry in that area. So that, that's going to be really a important piece, particularly for a state like California. That's great, actually, and really appreciate all the perspectives. Um, we're going to go to our last slide, and uh, this is going to be a lightning round. Each mm. panelist gets a minute, minute and a half to answer the question. Um, how do we keep California on top? And anything from how do we scale financing to grow our businesses and create more jobs? Would love to hear about leveraging new technologies, initial coin offerings, and blockchain. Um, and again, we've had a lot of discussion about reaching new industries and populations. Um, so I'll start on my left <laughs> and Richard ask you. Well, initial coin offering is great. You get to have your exit before you start your business. So um, ICOs I'm not a huge fan of. And I know people on the panel are going to debate with me. So I'm not, not going to vote ICO. Let's vote um, education, awareness, community building, reaching out to underserved communities. That's going to be the core in California to really make these, these rules. Have, the Valley will take care of itself. Silicon Beach will take care of itself. The rest of the state's going to need some programmatic intervention. That was less than a minute. Any more? Mm. Good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Ask a professor. <laughs> so two is Silicon Valley has a massive expertise in data and data science, but not a lot of that data science and expertise has been applied to the actual process of investing, with a couple small exceptions. Mm. Uh, look at what we're doing at CrowdSmart. There's a couple of other groups that are trying to do it. But the question is, how can you actually de-risk and make early stage investing more transparent and less based on who you know and more based on the fundamentals of the company? And I think it's, it's interesting that so much of the Valley still operates on the old boys network and it is the old boys network as opposed to actually data-driven decision making. That's great. Victor, how do we keep California on top? I think we've got to continue to leverage um, and adapt to new technologies. Um, we've got to get in the forefront and continue to do that. Um, we're doing a great job of it so far, but I think looking at how to do that, given the diversity of the state of California, um, to make sure that we're reaching all the different communities is going to be absolutely key. Um, and I think we talked about it a little bit earlier, youth entrepreneurship as well. Uh, we've got to start instilling that pipeline of youth entrepreneurship going forward um, again and how to address that in all the different communities that, that we navigate um, here in California because without those two things, we're going to continue to find that the other states that we're competing with are going to quickly catch up with us. And so in order to, to do that, and we've got to leverage our international trade. Um, we've got to start talking a little bit more about how to export. We're located in a prime location you know, as, as a key mm -hmm. for exporting. So I think that's, that's going to be key. And leveraging the public-private partnerships. Um, we have a tremendous wealth, we talked about it earlier, um, some of the great educational institutions that are here, um, private sector, government, bringing those together in a climate where we can actually promote technology and promote the diversity of, of our state is going to be key to keeping us moving forward. Thank you. And I'm smiling because I know there are some export advocates in the room right now. <laughs> Chris, how do we keep California on top? Okay. Well, I'm kind of going to go off my script a little bit on this one and not surprise anyone, though. <laughs> well, do you know what California is also number one in? Taxes. So capital gains taxes. And, and do we, I'm, I'm wondering if we know this. At the IRS level, how many of you are familiar with section 1202 and 1045 of the IRS? Boom. There you go. Well, of course. Now. Do, are you aware, this is unbelievable, I can't believe people that aren't aware of this, do you know that your first $10 million of gain on a qualified small business stock is completely sheltered from capital gains at the IRS level? $10 million, no capital gains taxes, as long as it is a qualified small business. Also, there's, I'm sure, hands up, are you familiar with the 1031 real estate tax-free exchange? Oh, yeah. Boom. Did you know there's also one for qualified small business stock called 1045? So I can make millions of dollars of gain in a qualified small business stock, and as long as I reinvest that in about, I think it's 60 days, I pay no taxes on that at the federal level. But California, there's absolutely no exemption there. You pay full vote taxes, and we're already at the highest tax level of any state in the country and pretty much the whole world. So I think to incentivize continued investment, we could have targeted tax treatment towards these early stage companies that are causing growth, company formation, and employment in California. That will absolutely, mark my words, keep California on top. Oh.
You got the. I shall take a bow. You take the bow. I'll leave on the applause. Let me get out of here. the lone wolf in the room. Exactly. Manny, go ahead. So earlier this year, when the anniversary of crowdfunding Reg CF came out, the whole industry did only fifty million dollars, and that was really dominated by two platforms. While that occurred in our office, we started realizing there's a large amount of people emailing asking if they can invest with cryptocurrencies, mainly coming from China. And, and I didn't know too much about cryptocurrencies, but I remember in 2013, I bought a few Bitcoin. So I looked at the account out of, the, yeah. out of my Coinbase account, and almost had a heart attack. <laughs> then I started researching blockchain, Ethereum, and the new ICO boom. During the time I researched it in mid um, summertime, it was over $2 billion was raised globally this year alone. Now it's over $3 billion. And so we are currently um, looking at doing one for real estate out of Singapore. And if you want to, we were looking for public comments. So we just uploaded our white paper draft on our, this website called realestateico.com. Feel free to look at it. We're looking for public comments for, from the lawmakers and everyone in here because I love to get feedback from everyone in the community. But I think that right now, many of the companies are unsure what to do with regarding selling their own cryptocurrencies. The laws are really slow to move. And if we want to be ahead and not have other countries take our money and be able to figure out how to organize it and tax it, uh, figure out how to move forward with blockchain and ICOs, and figure out some interstate regulation there, there's a lot of money moving in. Mm. Again, visit uh, real, real, um, real Estate ICO. I love to get public, public comments, realestateico.com. All right, so how do we keep California on top? I think, obviously, we continue to spur innovation in California. One of the great things um, about being here is, like we said, our education system and the fact that we really do encourage everyone to, uh, to push the envelope on what is possible in the state of California, and so I think that's the number one thing. I don't disagree that we need to incentivize investment in small business. I think it's one of the things where we have in California um, shortchanged the community. Uh, I also think public-private partnership is incredibly important on, on, moving, on moving our small business and moving California forward in general. But I think at the end of the day, diversity is the number one thing. You cannot have plurality if, if, you, if you cannot make it accessible to everyone. And so for me, it is incredibly important that, that not only are young people educated in what is possible as far as finance is concerned, but as far as entrepreneurship and what the options are and what is, what is actually possible. And that only comes from people like those in this room reaching backwards remembering where they came from. Remember, even if you didn't come from there, coming back into our communities and showing young people what actually is possible. It is so hard for some of our young people to imagine that even being in this room would ever be possible for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, We're talking about kids who live 20 minutes from the beach who've never seen the ocean, mm -hmm. but who are incredibly intelligent, incredibly talented. And I say all the time, in the 60 seconds, such a good microcosm because I try to tell the people, look, to my inner city kids, Mad EA is in our district. And if they knew for one second that math led to Madden, what, they're, what they are capable of and what they would dream of would be so much larger. <laughs> um, and so things like crowdfunding that create possibility and creating a, creating a platform in which in the state of California that's encouraged, creating a, a, a platform in California where small businesses are encouraged to grow, come here, stay here, grow here, is incredibly vital to the state of California. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, what is most important is that we lift everybody up together. I think that that's how we really keep California on top. Thank you. And I think, thank you for that clock, because yeah. I can't <laughs> see that one. We actually are out of time. Um, I hope that our panelists are sticking around for the rest of the day, and you can grab them if you have any questions. Um, but I just do want to thank all of you for participating. I think this was a really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to keep the conversation going, follow me on Twitter, okay. Manny Fernandez. Oh my God, no. That was fun. No, I nice done.